respected chairperson, the audience, end of the day, and they have asked me to speak on recent management of painful diabetic neuropathy. I'm not going to give you pain because very few audiences left out, and I know the, the pain of staying in the hall throughout the day, but I will very quickly pass through the recent concept of management of diabetic painful peripheral neuropathy. Those who have confronted patients with peripheral neuropathy might be knowing that it's not very easy to manage such cases as it's quite frustrating we do not have treatment and we prescribe one or the other medicine and it doesn't come out to the final solution. The prevalence is uh, quite high. 10% of patients may present with peripheral neuropathy at time of presentation. 50% develop neuropathy within 5 to 10 years and 60% of neuropathies are associated with pain throughout their life uh, in patients with diabetes. The risk factors of painful diabetic neuropathy or neuropathy, the age, longer the age, more is the chance, duration of disease, glycemic variability, A1C, smoking and alcohol consumption. And this cartoon actually is suggesting that people with advanced age have increased chance of peripheral neuropathy and also they complain of uh, painful peripheral neuropathy. The odd ratio for uh, longer duration of diabetes is again very high, almost six times uh, in patients who have diabetes less than five years than those who have diabetes of 15 years, so more chance of having peripheral neuropathy. Those who have more glycemic variability again have a high chance of peripheral neuropathy and this has been shown in the slide that major mean average of glucose excursion were quite high on 5.8% in those who have peripheral neuropathy. Then those who didn't have peripheral neuropathy, the mage was 4.5 and it was historically significant. So glycemic variability or glycemic excursion is again associated with increased chance of peripheral neuropathy. We know now the problem of peripheral neuropathy is quite common, it's quite frustrating. We do not have single drug available. We have a whole list of drugs acting centrally or some of them peripherally to relieve pain, but all of these medicines are not very efficacious as we have already experienced in our clinic. Coming to the second part of the, uh, the, the problem of peripheral neuropathy, we know that when there is a pain, there are two kinds of uh, sensitization. One is a peripheral sensitization and another is a central sensitization. The peripheral sensitization means there is a liberation of the cytokines, which is an inflammatory uh, sensitizing pool, and uh, uh, there is a, a, a quite large number of uh, cytokines which are further accentuating the problem of pain. So there will be sensitization and pain increases in, uh, in severity. This is followed by sensation of pain in the central region, that is in the thalamic region, and there is a kind of loop which perpetuates, and then it leads to uh, a change in the perception of pain. And very simple example, you might have experienced that repeated pain leads to some kind of hyperalgesia or allodynia, that mere uh, stimulus, any kind of stimulus give pain. So this kind of adaptation is taking place and we really do not know why it is happening. So when there is a persistent acute pain, it is followed by some remodeling of neuronal cytoarchitecture leading to a chronic pain which leads to uh, a different kind of perception that is hyperalgia, hyperesthesia or allodynia. So when uh, this cartoon again is showing how it occurs when there is tissue injury, the COX-2 pathway, the prostacycline pathway, uh, again promoting the pain sensation and there is acute pain. This is followed by change in the uh, heart center and that leads to a chronic pain. The chronic pain has a variable as I said that it may change the pain perception. This is a complex pathway. What is the importance here showing? that the, all these uh, changes which are taking place are finally ending at this point that is the liberation of calcium and cyclic AMP and thereby changing the pain perception. So we have a whole plethora of changes occurring here and they are finally con, uh, con, con, concerting on one point that is increasing the pain. 
if you look at these circles, there are some agents which have been tried. If they block the prostaglandin or they block the Cox pathway, there might be some relief in the pain and there's, that has been tried. But if you, if you are able to block this common thing, perhaps you will have a more uh, sustained response to pain amelioration. So if you really want to prevent pain, you must target at the peripheral level as well as the central level. Now this term neuroplasticity, this is just to explain what we are understanding in our mind, why this pain is occurring and how this pain perception is changing. The neuroplasticity means that there is some kind of dynamic change which are occurring in brain. But very age old concept that brain doesn't change in adulthood. Whatever we have changed our brain is during infancy and early life or youth. But we don't get any change in the brain tissue in terms of the, any architectural change or there is a functional improvement in adult life. That was the initial concept. And it was also considered that after the age, continuous neuron cell death occurs, atrophy of the mammalian brain begins and hardly there is a chance of any improvement. So is the neuroscientific dogma of unchangeable human nervous system really true? If we answer that, then we can't do anything for pain relief. Whatever we do, it will be a temporary thing. But if we really want to change or curve the course of pain in our brain, curve the course of pain sensation, we really want, we, we can really do something. So let us change our concept of understanding and that is the neuroplasticity. So what the experiments have shown that the, uh, uh, there is a constant change in the nervous system in response to newer stimuli or some strong stimuli to the brain. And these constant changes can be measured or assessed. Results reveal that brain can adapt to compensate the disease and disability. So it is not a, a kind of fixed thing. It is a dynamic process and that dynamism has actually uh, made us to understand that we can do something for pain amelioration. This was a very simple study in which they took uh, volunteers, 24 volunteers, and one group, 12, were subjected to juggler activity or some skill activity. The other group didn't perform that juggler activity. And then they measured the uh, brain anatomy by MRI <coughs> and also the function. And what they found that there was an increase in the gray matter of people who performed some skill work than those who didn't perform. And this kind of the anatomical changes which took place actually disappeared after both of them took rest and they were not involved in any kind of activity. It means that if there is a skillful activity, there will be some change in the brain and that can also translate into function. So human brain is incredibly adaptive. When one starts learning a skill over a period of time, it results into neural changes. This ability allows us to memorize new facts, master new skills and form new memories. And that reminds that even if somebody wants to become a musician at very advanced age, it is now no bar. Means people can uh, uh, perform or can do some uh, musical activity. So this ability of the neuron system to change the structure and connection is known as neuroplasticity. This was another experiment when repeated stimuli was given to animal model, what they demonstrated that there was a change in the uh, pain threshold. The pain threshold rises, but then after a year of this repeated uh, stimulus, the threshold became normal. And also the, the, uh, uh, the uh, changes in the perception threshold actually was uh, related to the time factor means with repeated stimulus, over a time, there was a further increase in the pain, pain threshold, but once the, the stimulus was uh, removed, the, there was a no change in the pain threshold. So this cartoon actually is again summarizing what I have said, that there is a peripheral activity in response to painful stimuli, and uh, it is sent to brain central sensorization that leads to hyperalgesia, spontaneous pain, allodynia and all these three uh, attributes are actually due to in decreased pain threshold because of the stimulus, enhanced expression of receptor at the central level and increased spontaneous activity. So you feel the acute pain followed by the chronic pain and uh, the chronic pain persists 
with hyperalgesia, spontaneous pain and allodynia and most of our diabetic patients actually are coming with this kind of problem. So if you have centrally acting drug, you can win over the problem of pain by reducing all these things. But the constant stimulus will persist. This is not given away and the, the whole thing, whole process can further be overcome after some time and medicine may not work. So, uh, uh, this was another good experiment of volunteers who had pain. They were given lidocaine centrally by intravenous and topically uh, nerve block. And what they demonstrated that after nerve block, sorry, after nerve block, the, uh, the pain relief was highest in the, uh, in the group where it was uh, applied topically than those who received systemic lidocaine. Systemic lidocaine has not done that benefit which was achievable by topical lidocaine application. So this experiment again proves what we have said that it is better to hit the peripheral sensation than the central alone. And we have most of the drugs available which we are using in our clinics like tramadol, gabapentin, pregabalin, amitriptyline, imipramine which are basically acting at the central level. So we really need to do something for the peripheral sensation and most of the random, randomized trials, RCTs including the pregabalin or amitriptyline have shown that these two drugs are equally effective or sometimes one is superior over the other. Some of the papers have said that uh, amitriptyline is far superior, other have said that pregabalin is non-inferior to amitriptyline. So, limitation of these central acting drugs that they work at the central level and I said that they really do not address the problem of pain. The another that on oral administration the concentration neural level is not achievable which is always there if we apply it topically and suboptimal sub doses will not work and there will be some side effects which is always there with oral agents. And this has shown that pregabalin and amitriptyline are equal and some of the paper have shown that amitriptyline is better. So mechanistically gabapentin has been found to reduce uh, release of neurotransmitter that are involved in nociceptive pain signaling such as glutamate, calcitonin, gene related peptide. These are the mediators of pain and pregabalin acts through these mediators of pain. But uh, the most important and specific effect of pregabalin is that it acts on the alpha 2 gamma subunit of L type uh, voltage dependent calcium channel and thereby it changes the uh, glutamate response uh, and uh, emulates pain. If we use topically this agent, we should have certain characteristic of topical agent. It must penetrate and it must stay in the skin. So unless it is there, we cannot use a topical agent for treatment of peripheral neuropathy. Gamma pentin featured for topical use, government is highly hydrophilic and it can penetrate and pharmacokinetics have suggested that application of GABA pentin, it lasts for 6 hours. The first hour, the concentration is achieved very high, that is 100, uh, 180, even 400, but then 180 level is maintained throughout. So up to 6 hours, the drug is retained in the skin. And uh, this is the retention of the drug concentration shown in the skin, uh, 28 to 29 in 6 hours. Results clearly indicate that high concentration of the applied dose gets accumulated in the skin and the concentration maintained in the skin for a period of 6 hours. Subsequently, accumulation of GABA pentin in the skin blocks the neural generation of pain impulses from the peripheral neurons. This is also showing that the uh, plasma concentration of GABA pentin following topical application is one tenth of what is achieved by oral uh, administration. So, we are achieving only one tenth of uh, systemic level of gabapentin, but same time the topical concentration is very high and that persists for six hours. So that is the advantage of topical application of gabapentin. The plasma concentration of gabapentin on topical application, as you can see here, that it was not that high and it is devoid of all those side effects of the systemic administration of gabapentin. So advantage of topical gabapentin inhibits peripheral sensitization, bypass the first pass metabolism, not metabolized in the liver, high concentration drug at site of injury, low systemic drug level, minimal adverse effect, no need to titrate dose, 
to tolerability and safe use of multiple mechanisms of action. So here, when we are using topical gabapentin, it will have more effect and uh, we can cut short the peripheral uh, pain sensation or allodynia or hyperalgesia due to adaptation at the central level. So the, uh, as I said that mechanism, it is acting on the common pathway, then the, these drugs like COX inhibitor or uh, capsaicin which is acting on the one component of the peripheral pain sensation. So uh, I want to summarize this presentation that all components of neuropathic pain depends on inputs from peripheral nociceptors. Repetitive uh, peripheral inputs leads to neuronal reorganization and persistence of pain, that is neuroplasticity mechanism. And blocking ongoing central sensation via peripheral interception uh, will be more rewarding and a fair role for old gold gabapentin because gabapentin had stood to the test of topical application getting showing effect and getting uh, minimally absorbed. So one can use gabapentin at first start. However, there might be many more molecules which will uh, actually act on the peripheral sensation and will give more benefit. But it is very easy to use and it is not associated with any fear of side effects. Uh, I think we should try and uh, give relief to our patients who are really having uh, we should buy time for them actually we are not changing the whole pathophysiology but buy time for them so that they pass off the agony of peripheral pain sensation. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you Dr. Singh.